they were not planning to stay in France permanently. The initial plan was to participate in the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, aiming to get recognition for the independence of Azerbaijan. It was supposed to be a temporary visit. Nevertheless, the return was delayed. The path back home was closed. They were destined to stay in Paris for life. When I traveled to Paris in 1971 to take an assignment with UNESCO, my biggest dream was to meet Azerbaijani immigrants who lived in France. Before departing from Baku, Maestro Niazi gave me a phone number. The number was for his uncle Jehun Bey, Haji Bili's son, Timuchin Bey, who lived in Paris. He suggested I give him a call. And Professor Abbas Zamanov gave me the phone number from Mamad Makharamov. He told me to get in touch with him as well. Back then, it was particularly dangerous for Soviet diplomats to get in touch with individuals who were involved in anti-Soviet activities. Therefore, for some time, I hesitated to contact anyone. Nevertheless, the fate of my compatriots, who never returned from the Paris Peace Conference, was troubling me. On March 14, 1973, I met the only surviving member of the mission, Mamad Makharamov. To be honest, at that moment, I did not trust this man. Back then, we considered all Soviet people to be the KGB spies. We were suspicious of everyone. Therefore, I took a precaution and placed a pistol in the drawer of the table. I assumed he was sent by Soviet special services. My suspicions were grounded. Back then, this kind of thing happened often in Paris. I am a piece of art. Don't know who is contemporary. I am a poem. Drown in doubts. Mamet Magaramov, born in 1895, studied at the Russian Imperial University Medical School, later transferred to Moscow University. In 1918, represented the socialist fraction in Azerbaijani parliament. In January of 1919, was dispatched to Paris Peace Conference as a counselor to Azerbaijani mission. After the coup of 1920, stayed in Paris for the rest of his life. Closely participated in the work of Caucasia's national representative offices in Paris. Took active part in Prometheus movement. From 1929 until 1939, was a member of Azerbaijan National Center. Worked as the treasurer of this organization. Gained fame as the renowned collector of books and antique pieces. Worked in small store in Paris. Fought for the independence of Azerbaijan until the end of his life. In order to avoid the possibility of any further war, similarly devastating to World War I, the international community decided to hold an international peace conference in 1918. Initiated and designed by allied nations, the Paris Peace Conference in reality was just another attempt to divide the world. Although representatives of 27 nations were participating in this event, only the great nations were deciding the fate of the world. Before coming to Paris, American President Woodrow Wilson had announced his famous principles, which later became known as Wilson's 14 Points, that strengthened hopes for freedom and independence of smaller nations. The last point of Wilson's principles inspired Azerbaijan to participate at the Paris Peace Conference. In summary, the final point approximately claimed to ensure the liberty and territorial integrity of nations, regardless big or small, the League of Nations should be founded. Azerbaijan also wanted to sign into the League of Nations. This was due to the crucial need to receive a guarantee for liberty and territorial integrity from great nations. The Azerbaijani government commenced forming the mission to Paris at the end of 1918. Ali Mardan Bey Topchubashov was appointed as the head of this mission. The mandate, which granted the official power to the mission, was signed on January 7, 1919. On this mandate, along with the head of the mission, Ali Mardan Bey Topchubashov, 
another six names were indicated. Mehmed Hassan Hajinsky, Ahmad Beyagayev, Akbar Aga Shehul Islamov, Mehmed Mageramov, Jehun Bey Hajibayev. Later on, Abbas Atmalibayev was also included into this mission as a member. Al-Akbar and Rashid Topchubashas have been included as technical staff, along with three translators, and all were dispatched to Paris. It is worth mentioning that in 1973, I was lucky enough to meet Al-Akbar Bey. The members of the mission had to come to Europe from Constantinople, Istanbul, after receiving the consent of victorious nations. This consent, in reality the receipt of visas, had delayed us in Turkey for a while. We were staying in Para Palace Hotel. Activities had included meetings and negotiation with officials of superpowers. Back then, representatives of other minority nations of the Russian Empire were in Constantinople, along with Azerbaijan mission, expecting to go to Paris. The path to Paris laid through this city. With the only exception, they had to be approved by the superpowers. Ali Mardan Bey was consistently sending reports to Baku about complications they were going through. Top Chubashov to the chairman of the Council of Ministers, Koiski. Today is January 17th and we were still not able to go to Paris. Fatali Khan, the more we are distant from Baku, the more I feel the weakness of our mission. Our neighbors have dispatched missions consisting of 12 very serious, respected and popular politicians. In addition to these, they already placed their own people and committees in Paris and London. You should seriously consider strengthening our mission. Also, please consider our financial situation as well. Armenians have around 10 million rubles in possession, Georgians only five for now. It is said that without considerable finances, it is impossible to accomplish things there. The only desire in our hearts, prosperity for the nation. The only point of concentration, liberty for the nation. Alimardan Bey Topchubashov was born in 1865. In 1888, received a law degree from Imperial University in Petersburg. For many years, was a member of Baku City Duma. From 1902 to 1905, was the first Muslim chairman of Baku City Duma. For a short period, was the editor-in-chief of Russian newspaper Kaspi. Was a member of parliament and head of Muslim fraction in the first Russian state Duma following the Declaration of Independence of Azerbaijan, was sent to Turkey as an ambassador with a mandate of a minister. During the same year, on December 7th, was elected as the chairman of the parliament. In 1918, he was appointed as the head of Azerbaijani mission to the Paris Peace Conference. Following the establishment of the Soviet regime in Azerbaijan, he did not return to Baku lived in Paris until the end of his days and did all he could to restore the independence of Azerbaijan. The Azerbaijani mission was going through some serious hardships. What caused them? Well, first, it was because in Western Europe, they had more information about Georgia and Armenia than Azerbaijan. Hence, Tabchibashov had to conduct a bigger propaganda operation. Initially, they had to print their memorandum in the best possible way, in highest polygraphic quality get it translated into good English and French. They did their best to create awareness about Azerbaijan. In addition to that, the Azerbaijani mission tried to publish articles about Azerbaijan in as many newspapers, magazines and journals as possible. Due to financial limitations, the staff of the Azerbaijani mission was significantly smaller than others. Dear Fatali Khan, today is January 27, and we still don't know when and if we will be going. Kindly asking you to consider the strengthening of our mission staff. All nations are sending their best, most renowned members to the conference. We have a big battle ahead of us. Give me my homeland, the paradise shall it be. The state I shall establish, the home of freedom it will be. 
Mehmed Khosan Hajinsky, born in 1871, earned a degree from the Petersburg Technology University on construction engineering. The member of Baku City Duma in 1913, briefly the head of Baku City Uprava, took an active part in the development of the Waterfront Boulevard, construction of Sholar Freshwater Pipeline, was always very active in Baku's modernization and improvement. Later on was a member of Transcaucasia Sejm, or Council. During the establishment of independent Azerbaijan, was appointed the foreign minister, finance minister. Sent to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 as a deputy chairman. In 1919, returned to Baku for two months and did not return to Paris after that. The obstacles for Azerbaijani mission's departure to Paris lasted until March, and by that time, some details were becoming clear. Following the meetings and conversations with English and French delegation, I became convinced that along with some technical problems, undoubtedly, our delay had a political reason. Indeed, the matter had been long politicized. The participation of minority nations in the Paris Conference was prevented on purpose. The Azerbaijanis especially were in a very complicated situation. They were considered a nation close to the former Ottoman Empire, allies to be more precise. Entente alliance states considered Turkey an enemy, a state that was defeated in World War I. There was another reason too. Allies considered Armenians as friends compared to the other Caucasian nations. Therefore, the very first mission which made it to Paris in January of 1919 was the Armenian group. The Armenians in their turn did everything possible to delay the Azerbaijani mission in Constantinople. In Constantinople, Armenians held a black PR campaign against Alamardan Bey Topchibashov, so he wouldn't be allowed to travel to Paris. A nasty campaign was initiated in the Armenian newspaper Renaissance, published in French, against the member of Turkish parliament Ahmad Bey Agayev, who was being accused of anti-ally statements. In the end, he was not only prevented from going to Paris, but got arrested. The mission, which already suffered from the shortage of professional and strong members, had to leave a very important man behind. In a number of meetings with many representatives of ally nations in Istanbul, only for the sake of receiving a visa to Paris. Unfortunately, this visa issue took rather long. While meeting the representatives of ally nations, Alamardan Bey Topchibashov had clearly realized they were more preoccupied with the fate of integral and undivided Russia. This was the main reason for the mission's delay. Nevertheless, Topchibashov was looking for options, kept addressing the chairs of the conference. To the chairman of the peace conference, copy President Wilson, the Prime Minister of England Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Italy, Orlando, the Prime Minister of France, Clemenceau. On May 28, 1918, the Republic of Azerbaijan was established with its primary city, Baku, population of 4 million and territory close to 100,000 square kilometers. It is governed by the Parliament of Caucasian Azerbaijan, headed by 14 ministers. The parliament consists of local Azerbaijani Turks as well as Russians, Armenians, and Jews. In order to gain the international recognition, the Parliament of Azerbaijan and its government had formed a special mission to the conference. The mission had left Baku with the approval and recommendation letter of General Thompson, the official commander of Allied forces in Baku. Azerbaijani mission had been in Constantinople since January 20th of this year and for two months had been awaiting the permission to join the conference. It is worth mentioning that the neighboring nations, Georgia, Armenia, and nations of Northern Caucasus, had already received that permit and currently represent their interests in Paris. It is a matter of grave importance for Azerbaijani mission to be present in Paris. Azerbaijan, which for six months had been struggling against the Bolshevik regime, still hopes for your attention and believes in principles of justice. 
We hope President Wilson's points will be implemented with consideration of our nation as well. Dear Chairman, considering above mentioned, it is our privilege to ask for your permission to be granted to Azerbaijani mission to travel to Paris and participate in the conference. On April 7, 1919, only three members of the mission, Gedzebeyev, Magiramov, and Gajinsky, were granted permission to go to Paris. Azerbaijani government had to agree with this decision, hoping for at least some representation. Moments after receiving this information, the deputy foreign minister Ziadkanov sent a telegram to Tiflis addressed to Jafarov, the head of Azerbaijani diplomatic mission. Kindly asking you to radio message the following to Tobchubashov, we recommend the mission not to delay and leave for Paris immediately. If you personally are not allowed to participate in the conference, we recommend handing the chair mandate to Hajinsky and dispatching the mission as soon as possible. Following the long-lasting meetings and correspondence, all of us were permitted to go to Paris. On April 22, 1919, we were able to leave Constantinople, catching an Italian ship. On April 30th, we reached Napoli, and on May 2nd to Rome. We spent another day there, awaiting an express train to Paris, and the next day we finally left. The Paris Peace Conference commenced on January 18, 1919, in De La Horloge Hall of the French Foreign Ministry. The Azerbaijani mission made it to Paris rather too late, on May 19th. The mission checked into the Claridge Hotel and started its activities. The activities included meetings with a number of missions, as well as promotion of Azerbaijan. This picture was taken at the Claridge Hotel in May of that year. Mamad Makharamov presented it to me in 1978. As you may see, all of them are very young and full of energy. They were very enthusiastic from the moment they got to work. It's important to mention, they managed some serious achievements in May. They were able to meet with US President Wilson, symbolically on the 28th of May, the day of Azerbaijan's independence. Wilson hosted a reception for Alimardan Topchubashov. During this meeting, Alimardan Bey courageously declared that, be it Kolchak or Denikin, or any other power within the former Russian Empire, the Azerbaijani government will refuse to recognize them. For us, the Azerbaijanis, there is only the Azerbaijani government and Azerbaijani parliament. We recognize and will recognize only our own government and our own parliament. After a month spent in Paris and a meeting with Wilson, Azerbaijani mission starts to clearly see the position of allies. Western countries were not interested in the establishment of smaller nations. They strongly advised Caucasian nations to establish the Caucasian Confederation. In the beginning of June, rumors on the official recognition of Kolchak as the leader of Russia started to spread. There were also rumors of Azerbaijan being reclaimed by Russia. Due to this, the protest note was sent to the chairman of the peace conference and prime ministers of allied nations on June 5. The note said, no matter who takes over in Russia, the Republic of Azerbaijan and its parliament and government will not become part of Russia. Around that time, the mission has sent the memorandum of independence to Woodrow Wilson. We tried to emphasize one particular point in memorandum. Geography clearly shows that Azerbaijan is separated from Russia by the Caucasus mountain. In addition, ethnically this nation has little to do with Moscow and overall Russian Slavic heritage. Nevertheless, the world leaders had a different opinion. I haven't seen any justice in the world so far. 
All I saw was crooked and unjust. Miryakup Mirmehdiev, born in 1891, studied in Petersburg Polytechnic University, later in Germany. Founding member of Itihad Party, elected to Transcaucasian Sejm. Member of the first Azerbaijani parliament. Included into the Azerbaijani mission to the Paris Peace Conference as a counselor. Following the coup of 1920 in Azerbaijan, had to live as a refugee was one of the leaders of Prometheus movement, lived in Turkey during World War II, fought for independence of Azerbaijan until the end of his life. From May 1919 until the end of 1920, the leaders of allied nations put their trust in the White Guard, which fought for unified Russia, and their leaders, Danikin, Kojak, Yudyanich, and other admirals and generals. They believed in the White Guard's ability to take over the Bolsheviks. At that moment, the independence of minority nations appeared to be a secondary issue. As if this was not enough, the Azerbaijani mission had to face another problem. The Iranian mission had claimed the entire Azerbaijani territory in their memorandum, June 9, 1919. The Iranian position was very ambiguous and different. Why? Initially, they did not recognize the independence of Azerbaijan. On the other hand, it was terrifying for them to have a common border with the Bolshevik Russia. Therefore, the rationale was to accept the independence of Azerbaijan. If the annexation appeared to be impossible, to be more precise, between these two options, they would have preferred the independence, just for the sake of not having a common border with the Soviets. On June 28, 1919, the former residence of French kings, Versailles, became a location where the official agreement ending World War I got signed. Although the Paris Peace Conference was held in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs headquarters, the selection of Versailles as the venue for agreement signing was not accidental. The Palace of Versailles was constructed in the 17th century by French monarch Louis XXIV. From 1682 to 1789, it was the official residence of French monarchs. In 1801, it became a museum. Later on, important events in France, as well as international events, took place in Versailles. For instance, the war which led to the independence of the United States of America was ended here with the signing of a peace treaty in 1783. It was here when Germans declared the establishment of the German Empire, ending the French-Prussian War of 1870-1871 by capturing Versailles. By signing the peace treaty here in Versailles on June 28, 1919, the French government wanted to humiliate the Germans. Nevertheless, the Versailles Peace Treaty did not guarantee any kind of recognition to Azerbaijan's independence. This was the reason why the Azerbaijani mission continued its work in Paris. The war in Russia and military actions of the White Guard around the Caucasus worried us a lot. Back then, we presented our fourth protest note to the conference, highlighting the danger which Denikin's forces posed against Azerbaijan and Georgia. The main bulk of our work concentrated on preparing promotional materials for the recognition of Azerbaijan. The propaganda work had been organized on the best possible level. For instance, they were publishing the Azerbaijan Bulletin in French. Even by today's standards, that bulletin is impressive. You can find it in the archives of the Foreign Affairs Ministry. There are some samples in Topchebashov's personal museum as well. In addition to this, many brochures and articles were published too. The Versailles Peace Treaty came into effect on January 10, 1919, following the ratification by all parties – Germany, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. The Versailles Peace Treaty was signed by only one defeated nation – Germany. 
All other defeated nations, including Turkey, had signed peace treaties in different locations and at different times, finalizing it by 1923. Hence, although the Versailles Peace Treaty was signed in 1919, the Paris Peace Conference continued its work with some breaks. The Azerbaijani mission made all efforts to voice Azerbaijan's concerns abroad. Dub Chubashov addressed the chair of the conference. Among those nations which patiently expect a political independence, this is a nation on the south of the Caucasus with a population of 4 million, living on the territory of 100,000 square kilometers. In 1919, Mehmed Hassan Gajinsky was sent to Baku to present the report on economic agreements signed in Paris. At the same time, he had to conduct meetings with government officials, discuss the internal and foreign issues, and deliver the general guidelines to the Azerbaijani mission in Paris. It was planned that he would return to Paris in two months. Nevertheless, Gajinsky remained in Baku. During the period Gajinsky was in Baku, he presented the following report to the Azerbaijani government. Representatives of allied nations demonstrate indifferent attitude toward the representatives of small nations. They officially support our aspirations for independence, but in reality do nothing of substance. It seems as they are waiting for something. The representatives of small nations are patient, so we are patient and waiting as well. The right of our nation to live independently is of no doubt. Taking advantage of every opportunity, we keep telling and writing about it everywhere we can. They are not interested in peace with Turkey. More importantly, they are trying to disintegrate this country. Armenians of Turkey, in cooperation with Armenians of Caucasus, push forward the unified Armenian principles. They avoid contacts with Georgians and us. You can find very few people here who do not inquire about our attitude towards Armenians and do not advise us to live in peace with them. Armenian lobbyists had started working in Europe 50 years prior to us. Armenian propaganda and immense amounts of financial resources allowed bringing many powerful allies on their side. This is their biggest advantage, and this helps hide the true dark intentions they have been harboring. Based on these circumstances, the Azerbaijani mission clearly understood that the recognition of Azerbaijan's independence is a very difficult task to fulfill. On September 9, 1919, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, answering a media question on the recognition of Caucasus republics, stated, The government of France hasn't recognized these states. The situation in Caucasus is very unstable and disorganized. Therefore, it is too early to talk about the existence of Transcaucasian republics. Allies simply do not address our issue in discussions. Moreover, it seems that they are very reluctant to do so. To be honest, during the meetings, they are extremely kind to us. They support our aspirations for independence. But the situation remains the same. On October 8, 1919, missions of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kuban, Latvia, Lithuania, Northern Caucasus, Ukraine, and Estonia addressed a joint appeal to the conference chairman Clemenceau. The appeal ended with the following words, For the sake of justice, peace, culture, and principles of humanity, as well as the right of our nations to join the League of Nations, by which we will be able to join the international family of free nations, we kindly ask you to deliver the following points to the Supreme Council of the conference. 1. We ask the above-mentioned states to be recognized as independent. 2. We ask to review their territorial and financial issues. Following this appeal, the very first good news was received. On November 17, 1919, the following letter from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France had been delivered to our residence at the Claridge Hotel to the head of Azerbaijani mission. We are honored to inform you that the Colonial League of France, under my chairmanship, made a decision on October 29th 
to support the claims of Georgia and Azerbaijan on de facto and de jure recognition of their states. I cordially hope that this declaration will assist your nations in the pursuit of independence. Signed, Berdari. A bloody shroud on the path to liberty. If even I die, my homeland shall live. Jehun Gajabeyev, born in 1891, brother of the great composer Uzer Gajabeyev, recognized journalist and social activist. Studied in Baku, St. Petersburg, and Paris. Served as the editor-in-chief of the official newspaper of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan. Counselor of the Azerbaijani mission to the Paris Peace Conference. Following the coup of 1920, had to remain in Paris as a political refugee. Active member of the Prometheus movement throughout 1927 to 1933. Worked as the editor-in-chief of Caucasia's magazine published in French. Contributed to a number of magazines published in France with articles on Azerbaijani history, literature, and language. Fought for freedom of Azerbaijan until the end of his life. On November 17th, Lloyd George mentioned Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia twice during his speech in the House of Commons, when he stated that they do not wish to rejoin Russia again. This was a significant statement. However, it did not mean recognition of Azerbaijan's independence. Besides, the situation in Azerbaijan during those days was extremely tense. Armenians massively attacked Azerbaijani settlements, particularly in Zangazur province. The Azerbaijani government responded with troops that caused immediate protest from superpower states. Deputy High Commissioner of Britain in Transcaucasia, Colonel Ray to Mr. Usubayev. According to my reports, Azerbaijani troops pulled around Zangazur have been on offense. On behalf of the peace conference and as a representative of the conference, I insist you take measures to prevent bloodshed. To Colonel Ray, as a response to your telegram dated 14th of November, I am honored to declare that Zangazur is an inseparable part of the Republic of Azerbaijan, as was also confirmed by the Command of the Allies High Commissioner of Peace Conference, Colonel Haskell. According to the latest reports, Azerbaijani government had to send military aid to Governor General of Karabakh to establish order on this territory as a response to the Armenian military deployment in Zangazur. Chairman of the government, Nasib Bey Usubayev. By the end of 1919, Bolsheviks further strengthened their positions in Russia in the battles against the White Guard, gaining serious achievements. At the beginning of 1920, Danikin was in fact defeated. His army retreated to Rostov. So the question was, what to do? That was the time when renowned political figure, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs of Great Britain, Lord Curzon took the initiative and declared that they needed to recognize two main states that could potentially prevent the Bolsheviks' advancement in the Caucasus, Azerbaijan and Georgia. On January 11th, sovereignty and independence of Azerbaijan and Georgia were already de facto recognized. January 14th was declared as a non-working day, and official celebrations started. The celebration program started with celebration prayers at Tazapir Mosque at 11 a.m. At the same time, a big crowd gathered in front of the parliament. The crowd demanded Mamad Amin Rasul Sadeh. He was carried in their arms to the balcony of the second floor of the parliament. Mamad Amin Rasul Sadeh delivered an inspirational speech in front of the crowd, stating, The world learned about Azerbaijan's national independence and repeated his famous quote, The flag, once raised, will never fall. We managed to partly fulfill our historical mission and the Paris Conference finalized its main work on January 21. Later, 
meetings on different topics were gathered in other capitals of Europe. We were trying to voice Azerbaijan's just position during these meetings. Unfortunately, not everybody knew Azerbaijan very well. My nation's hand is absent among signatures of other people. Abbas Bey Atamalibeyev, born in 1895, got his education in Political Sciences Institute in Paris. Afterwards, was a member of the Transcaucasia Sejm, was elected as a representative of the Socialist Bloc to Azerbaijani Parliament, served as a secretary in the delegation sent to the Paris Conference in 1919, after coup d'etat in Azerbaijan had to stay in expatriation, known as one of the active members of the Prometheus Movement. In 1941 to 1945, lived in Germany, member of Special Caucasia's headquarters. Fought for restoring Azerbaijan's independence until the end of his life. While Azerbaijan was living the joy of de facto recognition of its independence, in March of 1920, the situation in the Caucasus became tense again. In the middle of April 11th, the Red Army of Soviet Russia was deployed to Dagestan. Bolsheviks were approaching the Azerbaijani border. At the beginning of 1920, this topic was raised. What should we do? To prevent the advancement of Bolsheviks? Or to leave the Caucasus? What to do? Eventually it was decided, with Lord Curzon's blessing, to supply Azerbaijan and Georgia with weapons. Lord George, Prime Minister of Britain at the time, was also defending this idea. At the time, when the English actually agreed to arm Georgia and Azerbaijan, a new problem arose. The Armenians, they were revolting in Karabakh. The high commissioners of Great Britain, France and Italy in Caucasus were not able to pacify the Armenians, even in the note they issued with the demand of restoration of peace in Transcaucasia. The Azerbaijani government deployed troops to Karabakh to establish order on this territory. The Azerbaijani government had to send a big part of its 40,000-man army to Karbakh to suppress that revolt. Hence, the safety of the roads to Azerbaijan from the north and Baku itself was dependent on a very small army. There were only three national battalions in Baku itself. More precisely, only a few thousand people in total confronted the 11th Red Army. The 11th Red Army enters Baku. The government is overthrown by Bolsheviks on the 28th of April of 1920. You tell to not talk, to keep silent, but for how long? Shall I stay in prison of depressions and separations? Why should I keep silence, not talk? I have my share in humanity. This robbed country is my motherland. Ahmad Javad. A few days before this, Mamad Ghassan Gajinsky was assigned with the task to form a new government in Azerbaijan. However, he was inclined to cooperate with the Bolsheviks, delaying realization of this task. Despite his struggle for Azerbaijan's independence in Paris, his betrayal of national ideals seemed to have angered God itself. Mamad Ghassan Gajinsky was arrested in December of 1930, and on the 8th of February 1931, he hanged himself with the rope he made from bedsheets. Those who stayed in Paris were receiving contradicting reports on what was happening in Azerbaijan. Starting from May of 1919, the English banned all delegation members, Georgians, Azerbaijanis and North Caucasians, from direct communication with Baku, Tbilisi and Timur Khanshura. Thus, members did not have direct connection with their countries. All telegrams On were delivered May 3rd, via Adam allies. Adam Ardan Bey the the made a request in a letter to the chairman of the Council of Ministers and Minister of Foreign Affairs of France. We have been receiving conflicting reports from Paris newspapers on deployment of troops to Baku by Soviet Russia for the past two days. Unfortunately, 
peace delegation of the Republic of Azerbaijan in Paris, which I am the head of, is unaware of all these. On behalf of the delegations, I kindly ask Your Excellency to ensure necessary actions are taken to deliver the letter to the Chairman of Cabinet of Ministers of the Republic of Azerbaijan via telegraph. At the time, Baku was run by the Bolshevik laws. Representatives of the superpower states, which had previously been making passionate statements on just and fair government of the world only a few months ago, were turning a blind eye to the occupation of Azerbaijan. But the delegation was still hopeful that big states would help to restore Azerbaijan's independence. They were sending appeals to almost all European states. Nevertheless, these appeals were left unanswered and Azerbaijan's issue was closed. And the members of Azerbaijan's delegation in France had to join the row of expatriates in the country by making small changes to their surnames. Alemardan Bey started signing documents not as Topchubashov, but as Topchubashi. Shehul Islamov became Shehul Islam Zada. Jehun Gajibayev presented his articles as Gajibayli. When the delegation learned about the uprising in Ganja in 1920, they were hoping that the Bolshevik government would not last long. However, this illusion disappeared soon too. Considering the new reality, Paris representatives of the Caucasus nations finally decided to unite around the idea Alamardan Bey had proposed years before, Confederation. Even though this question was discussed many times, there were no real results. Finally, on the 10th of June of 1921, representatives of Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia, and mountainous nations, signed a declaration called Union of Caucasus States. By establishing a new alliance, we were relying on Turkey this time. We believed that Turkey could play the main role in ousting Bolsheviks from Caucasus. To clarify these issues, I was sent to Turkey in October of 1921. But the agreement Turkey signed with Moscow and Kars crossed out all of these hopes. Russia managed to ban any political activity against itself in the neighboring country. No matter how great the oppression, I shall resist. Do not let the oppressor think I shall retreat. Akbar Aga Shehul Islamov, born in 1891, got his education in St. Petersburg Railway Engineers Institute member of Transcaucasia Sem. Appointed to the position of the Minister of Agriculture and Labor of Azerbaijan at the age of 27. Served as a member of the Delegation of Azerbaijan in Paris Peace Conference starting from January 1919. Forced to live as a refugee from 1920. Member of Azerbaijan National Center represented National Center and Liberty Committee of Caucasus fought for Azerbaijan's independence as a state until the end of his life. Later, with the hope of restoring justice, the Azerbaijani delegation attempted to participate in Geneva, London, Genoa, Luzan conferences as they were trying to deliver Azerbaijan's message across European cities. But their voice was no longer heard. The situation in Europe had changed itself. Yesterday's allies of the Versailles Treaty were living through some major disagreements. Europe was an economic crisis. In this case, the promise of support of independence of smaller nations got pushed to the background. If during the peace conference they were sympathetic to us and helping us, later they were just tolerating us. After Lausanne Conference, political figures we used to meet either preferred to look at us in silence or get rid of us by advising us to wait for better times. 
Italy, in February of 1924, and France in October of the same year, recognized Bolshevik Russia. This decision was a blow to the overall Caucasus refugee community. Yes, although not the last, we received another blow that worsened our already poor situation. However, God is merciful. I do not lose my hope. Unfortunately, our budget restricts our ability to leave Paris and our chances to maintain our previous connections even in Paris itself. According to Alimardan Bektop Chubashi's notes, the members of the delegation were looking for additional jobs to support themselves. But not everybody was able to accomplish this. For instance, Akber Adah Sheikhul Islam Zadah could find a job neither in Paris nor in Berlin and emigrated to Turkey. Mirya Kub, Min Mehdiyev's health deteriorated. Jehun Gajabayli's son was not allowed to attend classes due to tuition non-payment, and Topchubashi, along with living situation problems, was ill. Topchubashi's problems started in 1926, after his son Rashid's death. Meanwhile, the Soviet KGB was at work day and night to discredit the expatriates. In April of 1925, the Soviet newspaper Novaya Gruzia published a report about Tabchubashov, arguably making a request to the USSR National Foreign Affairs Commissar Chicherin to allow him to return to Azerbaijan. I firmly declare that I did not and will never make any request to Chicherin or anybody else, neither in person nor through anyone else, neither here nor anywhere else. Those who build their lives on lies and deny any principles tend to judge others by their own standards. As a person who served his nation for 30 years, why should I conceal my anti-Bolshevik stance? There has been no ground for me to change my position, and there is not any now. By the end of April of 1926, Józef Pilsudski comes to power in Poland. Since the Russian Empire, now the Soviet Union, usually treats non-Russian ethnicities well, he does his best to create a single organization in this regard. This organization is created in 1926. The organization called Prometheus gathers representatives of Caucasus, Ukraine, and Turkestan's national liberation movements. Nevertheless, recognition of the USSR by the Western states one after another drastically changes the situation. The delegation tries its best to have Western states at least not recognize Azerbaijan as a part of the USSR. For this purpose, Alamardan Bey conducts negotiations with big oil companies. In 1926, he managed to direct the attention of a number of renowned oil industrialists, including Henry Deterding, to Azerbaijani oil. Deterding signed an optional agreement with the Azerbaijani delegation. The agreement was signed with the help of French businessman Daman. It's noteworthy that Topchibashi acted as a state official. He was defending Azerbaijan's interests. More precisely, this contract was not as much in favor of Deterding or other business persons as it was for Azerbaijan. This agreement had a purpose of turning oil industrialists' attention towards Azerbaijan's independence. In 1927, conflict between Great Britain and the USSR deepens and diplomatic relations get broken. This was a very important period, and the English were actively working for this purpose. For instance, I saw some military plans when I used to research English archives. In these plans, military operations against the Bolsheviks and the Caucasus were considered. More precisely, military plans against the Bolsheviks did exist at the time. These plans were not realized. Nevertheless, Azerbaijani expatriates remained hopeful despite declining of financial resources every year. Dear Abdul Ali Amerjanov, Currently, my financial situation is regrettable. I have not been able to receive 1,500 francs I was supposed to, and I need to repay the Georgians. I kindly ask you to raise this issue regarding my debt to Georgians so that I can repay it. I have spent this money on cafe visits, tram fees, correspondence, in short, for work purposes during nine months. 
At the end of the 1920s, the financial condition of the Azerbaijan mission was complex. It should also be noted that the Polish played a major role in financially supporting the Azerbaijani delegation. Because when the Prometheus movement and the Caucasus Liberty Committee were created in 1926, all members of the Azerbaijani delegation were assigned at least some allowances. This allowed them to live and engage in political activity. Of course, that allowance was not enough. I even appealed to the old Nobel here. He said that there were no options for loans or cash, but he did not object. He asked me to give them some time to think what could be done. We cannot rely on him, but he feels obliged to us. Like representatives of other nations, we are also waiting patiently. We believe our independence will be restored. At that time, Ali Mardan Bey could no longer afford to live in Paris. He moved to a city near Paris called Saint Cloud. Rent was cheaper there. Despite these difficulties, Ali Mardan Bey kept looking for new ways to fight. Topchubashi himself, by the way, was writing about this. He admitted that the Azerbaijan delegation had done their best. And now we needed to change our tactics. Because the Soviet Union was already recognized. And we needed to move to a new phase in the fight for national liberation. At the end of the 1920s, the situation drastically changed. Most of the Western countries recognized Soviets. At that time, the issue of the Union of Caucasus Nations resurfaced among expatriates. In 1932, discussions on creating a Caucasus Confederation started. Numerous meetings were held. Representatives of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Northern Caucasus Nations committed themselves to creating a Swiss-like Union Confederacy after the liberation of the Caucasus from the Bolsheviks. This obligation was reflected in a document called the Confederation Pact. The Confederation Pact was signed in Brussels in July of 1934. Ali Mardan Bey Tapchubashi and Mamad Amin Razulzadeh signed the pact from Azerbaijan's side. At the time, Ali Mardan Bey was ill. He signed the document with shaking hands. Signing of the pact was the last heroic act of Tapchubashi. A few months later on, 5th of November 1934, Ali Mardan Bey passed away. He was buried at the cemetery of the city, St. Cloud, where he had lived. Caucasians, Ukrainians, Turkestanians, and French delivered speeches over his grave and published condolences in expatriate newspapers. After that, the other members of the Azerbaijani delegation continued their struggle for many years in France and other countries and waited until the end of their lives for the day when the independence of Azerbaijan would be restored. Miryakup Mirmirdiev moved to Turkey during World War II. He passed away in 1949 and was buried there. Abbas Atamaliev went to Chile. I do not have any information about his later fate. Some say he passed away in 1971. Akbar Aga died in 1961. We buried him at the cemetery of the city of Bobigny. At the time, this was the only Muslim cemetery in France. At the times when my health allowed me, I used to visit graves of Ali Mardan Bey and my other comrades. Ali Mardan Bey was buried at the cemetery of St. Cloud. He lived the last years of his life out of need in this city, and his last destination was the cemetery of this city. Jehun Hajibeli was also buried at St. Cloud Cemetery. He passed away in 1962. Jehun Bey's family members were also buried at this cemetery. There is a tradition in France all family members are buried at the same cemetery. Ali Mardan Bey, his wife and sons are also buried in the same grave. Therefore, I live, losing my comrades and friends one after another. I hope at least I will be able to see the independence of Azerbaijan. I am waiting for that day, desperately waiting.
Mahmoud Maharamov himself passed away in 1982. I participated in his burial. We buried him at Montparnasse Cemetery in Paris. None of them got to see Azerbaijan regain its independence. But each of them had an exceptional service in writing Azerbaijan's name as an independent state in the political map of the world. It was because of their dedication and heroism that Azerbaijan's independence was de facto recognized in January of 1920 in Paris. Having declared independence 17 days before us and arrived in Paris even before our delegation with the same aspiration, the efforts of representatives of the Republic established by Northern Caucasus nations went in vain. The world did not recognize them and independence dreams of mountainous nations have not gone further than autonomy even to this day. We could have lived the same destiny if Azerbaijan's independence had not been recognized de facto at that time. Yet, the idea of Azerbaijan's independence lived even after the collapse of the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic and got finalized in 1991. During his first official visit to France, the founder of modern Azerbaijan, the national leader Gaydar Aliyev paid a visit to the gravesite of Alamardan Bey Topchubashov and Jehun Hajibeli. Since then, the abandoned graves and tombstones in Paris were restored and taken care of. Now, in this foreign country, souls of liberalists, fighters for freedom, no doubt find rest in existence and successes of independent Azerbaijani state. All know, you are mine, my home and hearth, motherland of mine. Arılar mı? Çönül candan. Azerbaycan. Azerbaycan. Azerbaycan.